I think I know almost everyone here, but for those of you who do not know me, I'm Sophia McLennan. I'm the director of the Center for Global Studies and the associate director of the School of International Affairs. And I'd like to thank you for uh, taking the time to come join us today. I'm just going to do a brief introduction of our speaker. Um, Ian Johnston is professor of international law at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where he's been a faculty member since 2000. In 2005, he was the recipient of the James L. Paddock Teaching Award, and from 2013 to 2015, he was the academic dean. Prior to joining Fletcher in the year 2000, uh, um, Ian Johnston served as the United Nations Executive Office, served in the United Nations Executive Office of the Secretary General. His most recent books include the Oxford Handbook, Handbook on International Organizations, Law and Practice of the United Nations, and the Power of Deliberation, International Law, Politics, and Organizations. He's written numerous articles and book chapters on the UN Security Council, international law, and international relations. From 2005 to 2007, he was the lead author and founding editor of the Annual Review of Global Peace Operations. He's currently on the editorial boards of Global Governance Journal and International Organizations Law Review. He continues to serve as a regular consultant to the UN and is a non-resident senior fellow at the Center on International Cooperation at New York University. A citizen of Canada, he holds an LLM degree from Columbia University and JD and BA degrees from the University of Toronto. And I learned last night that he can vote nowhere. <laughs> so he is definitely the person to ask about the elections because he's got no skin in it. Um, his talk today is entitled, The United Nations in Crisis, Priorities for the next secure Secretary General, please join me in offering him a warm welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. McLennan. It's, it feels strange using those words. One, one part of my biography that she did not mention is that we are childhood friends from a time when we were both under 10 years old, uh, largely because our mothers were very close friends and are still very close friends. So we've known each other for a long time. We lost touch and uh, last summer we, we reconnected and uh, I was really excited to hear about all the interesting things that she's been doing and the interesting things that the Center for Global Studies and the School of International Affairs are, are doing. So it was a real pleasure to be asked to come and speak here, so I'm, I'm happy to do it. I saw many of you earlier today in her class, which I thought was fascinating. I said I learned a lot from it, and uh, I'm also hoping to learn more in the questions and answers today. Um, so my topic is this. The, the slide is not nearly as elegant a slide as, uh, as some of the ones that um, Dr. McLennan just put up there, but this is the topic. Um, it's a um, obviously an opportune moment to be discussing this um, because we just had the election of the next Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Uh, it means it's a moment to reflect on the future of the United Nations and I think it's important to reflect on that future because from my point of view, as somebody who observe, has observed it up close for a long time, it really is in a crisis. Um, and, and the crisis is uh, partly as a result of the, of the turmoil around the world the escalating conflicts, the new threats to human security, uh, geopolitical order that's becoming increasingly confrontational. Uh, but it's also in part self-inflicted. Okay? Bad diplomacy in the UN Security Council, mis mismanagement in UN headquarters, problems in the field and peace operations, humanitarian operations, uh, where not only is the UN not doing much good, but on occasion actually perpetrating positive harm. Uh, and so it's a moment to be thinking about the organization. Uh, there's only so much that any Secretary General can do about this. Um, uh, this is a problem for the international community, the member states of the organization. But having been there myself, I know that the Secretary General does have substantial influence, more influence than meets the eye. Uh, 
Uh, and I think Antonio Guterres is in a position to, to make a difference in the organization. I'm hopeful that he will make it a, a good difference in the organization. And so I'm going to reflect a little bit on, on how and why and what sort of priorities he, he needs to bring to the task. Um, I'm going to be dividing my talk into three different topics. The first one is the nature of the UN crisis, and I divide it into a crisis of relevance and a crisis of legitimacy. I'm then going to talk about the role of the Secretary General, somewhat in the abstract, and then say a little bit more about the appointment process and how we ended up with the Secretary General that we're going to have starting in the beginning of uh, next year. And then finally, review some of the priorities that I see for the next Secretary General, what he should make the focus of his attention. And, and I want to emphasize here that these are not necessarily the world's top priorities. They're not even necessarily the UN's top priorities. They're issues on which he can add value and the issues on which he can add most value. So the places where he really ought to be exercising most of his energy and attention. Okay? So that doesn't necessarily mean these are the world's biggest problems. It's the world's problems that he is in the best position to have a direct impact on. And that also says something about understanding the scope of the authority and the power of the Secretary General. It's not unlimited, but there are places and there are ways in which you can make a difference. Okay? Um, so, starting with the crisis of relevance. Uh, the, I get to look at this. The, um, I think the most obvious manifestation of this is the paralysis of the UN Security Council. Okay? It's simply unable to even deal with, even to begin to talk about some of the big geopolitical issues of the day. Okay? Um, largely as a result of disagreements between Russia and the US, but not entirely, hasn't been able to accomplish much on Syria. Okay? Largely as a result of Russia having a veto power, hasn't been able to do anything on the Ukraine. Okay? South China Sea, Never going to be able to touch South China Sea because China is not going to allow that to become a topic. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict on the agenda of the UN Security Council, but the Security Council can do very little on that. Okay? So there's some big important issues of the day where, for the most part, the organization and the Security Council is mission, missing in action. Okay? Um, secondly, even when the Security Council is able to agree, the nature of the threats and challenges it has, it has to deal with have become much more complicated. Terrorism is an obvious example of that. It's actually an issue on which the five permanent members of the Security Council can agree, and there's expectation on the part of the rest of the UN membership that the organization ought to do more, but doing more can't simply mean more drone strikes, more special operations. Okay? It really has to get at the conditions that give rise to violent extremism, give rise to terrorism, and on that, the UN is floundering. Third, there are new transnational challenges that have seemingly overwhelmed the ability of the system to cope. <coughs> Refugee and migration crisis, cyber attacks, cyber security, infectious disease, organized crime, to name a few. These are transnational challenges, and an organization built in 1945, founded on the principle of sovereign equality, is not well placed to deal with these transnational um, finally, the development work of the United Nations is also facing a potential crisis, a looming crisis. It's an area where the organization has been relatively successful. The Millennium Development Goals, adopted in the year 2000, went a long way to facilitating, weren't responsible for entirely, but facilitating the reduction in absolute poverty around the world. But there's still 800 million people who live in extreme poverty. And this concerningly, inequality around the world is rising. Inequality between countries and inequality within countries. Oxfam just came up with a statistic saying that the 1% of the richest people in the world have equal wealth to the other 99%. Okay? They're predicting that that's going to happen in the year 2016. It's almost there, and they're fairly certain we're going to get there in the year 2016. So this growing inequality. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals are uh, an attempt 
to address this, a new set of goals. I'll say a bit more about, about those in a moment. They're an attempt to address this, but some people think they're just so ambitious that they're going to quickly fade into a wood. Um, the crisis of legitimacy. Again, here, the UN Security Council is the primary culprit. Okay? Uh, the permanent members and their veto power are tied to the end of World War II. These were the victors in World War II, and they essentially granted themselves some special privileges. That's understandable. Without those special privileges, the UN would never have come into existence. Okay? And if it had, it would have quickly been ignored if it ever tried to act in a manner that was contrary to the global power structure as it existed at the time. Okay? It was a fact of geopolitical life, understandable, even though from the perspective of today, not so easy to stop. Okay? Seventy years later, the composition of the Security Council with the five permanent members, uh, as they are holding the veto power, is a lot harder to justify, especially with emerging and resurgent powers who were excluded from this inner sanctum. Okay? Germany, Japan, India, Brazil, South Africa, Indonesia, Turkey, geopolitically important countries that have virtually nothing like the power that the UN, the five permanent members do, even when they're elected um, to the council. And then adding to the problem, okay, those who make the decisions in the Security Council are often not the principal implementers of those decisions. Okay? So UN peace operations is one of the highest profile activities of the UN in the field of peace and security. These are the five top contributors to UN peace operations, Ethiopia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Rwanda. The five permanent members come next on the list. The largest contributor among those five is China, comes in number 12, France number 34, the UK number 52, Russia 68, and the US uh, 30 behind Russia, uh, at 73rd place, okay? Um, the crisis of legitimacy also stems from ineffectiveness. Okay? Every peace operation since the year 2000 has been tasked, among other things, with protecting civilians. Yet, you only need to read the recent news about South Sudan, about the Democratic Republic of Congo, to know how far short the UN is falling in that area. Okay? Protection of civilians, is essential, a priority given to every peace operations, and yet its ability to fulfill that essential function is extremely compromised. Okay? Meanwhile, the UN has as one of its central purposes the promotion of human rights and humanitarian law. Look at Syria, and you can see where violations on all sides are rampant. Um, this is tied to the third and in some ways the most disconcerting dimension of the crisis of legitimacy, the self-inflected wounds. Okay? Instances where the organization fails not only to do good, but actually does positive harm. Sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers is the most damaging illustration of this. Despite efforts made in the last 10 years, allegations continue to surface, most recently in the Central African Republic, in 2015, there were 69 reported incidents. These are peacekeepers engaged in sexual exploitation and abuse, the highest number since 2011. So the numbers started going down, and now they're going back up a little bit. And those, of course, are under the reported incidents. Okay. Failure to take responsibility for the spread of cholera in Haiti is another example. Okay. For six years, the UN denied any responsibility for the cholera outbreak there, widely understood to be the fault of peacekeepers from Nepal. 770,000 Haitians have been infected, 9,000 died. Okay. At public hearings in the race for this Secretary General, candidates were asked whether the UN should acknowledge and apologize for this. Okay. Only one, Cristiana Figueres, raised her hand when asked that question. Okay. I should note that Antonio Guterres is not on that slide. The, the, these public hearings were divided into two, so these were five of the candidates. All five were asked, should the UN even acknowledge any responsibility for this? She was the only one who said yes. Since then, recently, a couple of weeks ago, Ban Ki-moon finally said for the first time, we take some blame for what happened. But it's a very partial and very belated acknowledgement of the UN's role here. Okay? So bottom line, the UN's facing an existential challenge unlike any it has faced since the start of the Cold War in 1947. 
And as I said, there's only so much the Secretary General can do about this, but there are things. There are some things that can be done. Um, before I return to what those things are, what the priorities are, I want to say a few words about the role of the Secretary General. It's not easily described because it's nowhere defined. Okay? There's some language in the UN Charter, but the language is vague and much more important than the words in the UN Charter is how the role has been interpreted by the Secretary Generals themselves and by the member states who react to or stimulate action by the Secretary General. Trig B. Lee, when he handed over the keys to the office to his successor, the second Secretary, Dag Hammarskjöld, described it as the most impossible job in the world. That was in 1952. The job has not gotten any easier, largely because there are now 193 bosses, 193 member states who can't agree on a whole lot, and those are in effect the bosses of the Secretary General. Okay? Um, but based on my own experience and what I've read uh, that the Secretary Generals have written about this and others have written about this, I'll divide the role into three. Okay? Chief Administrative Officer of the organization, the office's role, and the role as norm entrepreneur. Okay? First one, the CAO role, Chief Administrative Officer, that's essentially the secretary part of the term Secretary General. And that in itself is a mammoth task. Okay. Essentially what it means is overseeing a staff of 76,000 whose job it is to serve the member states of the organization in some way. And that means everything from translating meeting documents to managing dozens of highly complex peace operations, humanitarian operations. Okay? And that's the administrative role. Okay. The good office's role refers to anything the Secretary General can do of a diplomatic nature to help prevent manage or resolve a conflict. So that means, may mean sending a fact-finding mission to Yemen. It may mean serving as a mediator between the warring factions in South Sudan. Or it may mean serving as an honest broker to, pr to try to bridge the differences among the members of the Security Council in what to do about Syria. Okay. And finally, the norm entrepreneur role involves pushing new ideas like the responsibility to protect, or weighing in on sensitive legal issues like the legality of drone strikes in Somalia. It also means using the bully pulpit to speak on behalf of the world's people and trying, in so doing, to hold governments to account. Now, all three of these roles entail a certain amount of independence for the Secretary General. There has been wide variation among the Secretary Generals in how independent and proactive they were. Okay? I worked for two of them, Secretary General Boutros Scali and Secretary General Kofi Annan, and both of them were relatively proactive and independent. Probably the most active was Dag Hammarskjöld, the second Secretary General. But Boutros Scali, Kofi Annan were up there. Boutros Scali, in fact, was so independent that he earned himself a veto to the United States when he was running for a second term. Okay? <laughs> Ban Ki-moon has been more cautious. Okay? His greatest accomplishments are probably cajoling governments on climate change, coordinating negotiations around the sustainable development goals. And when it comes to the crisis management role, he's been a lot more cautious. His record is a lot less impressive. And only recently has he begun to speak publicly on sensitive topics like the atrocities of the Bashar Assad regime in Syria. Um, now, as of a week ago, we have a new Secretary General. Antonio Guterres. Um, this is him when he was a high commissioner for, human, uh, for refugees. Um, but the story of his election is kind of interesting, and I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about it. Normally, the process for electing, selecting a secretary general is highly secretive, okay? and almost all of the power is in the hands of five permanent members of the Security Council. Okay? The Security Council has to make the recommendation and the Security Council is only going to make the recommendation if those five permanent members agree. So it all happens there. Okay? This time, it's a little bit different. Okay? Under pressure from civil society and a lot of smaller states, the process has been more open, more inclusive. Okay? Some job criteria were announced. Governments were called on to publicly nominate candidates. The nominees issued vision statements to look on a website and see what each of the candidates said they could do as Secretary General. 
And there were public hearings where all 12 of them were actually grilled, which is completely unusual. So every member state was able to sit in front. They were in front of these states and they were asked questions from other states and from civil society. Okay? Now, did it make any difference? Yes and no. No, because at the end of the day, it was the five permanent members that decided. And essentially, it was US and Russia that were the main protagonists in the behind the scenes Okay? So bottom line, it's still the P5. Almost impossible to get away with that as long as they've got the veto power. But it did make a difference uh, in a couple of ways. To begin with, he was not the favored candidate at the beginning of this process. Okay? It really was a result of the more inclusive, more open process that he managed to rise to the top. Okay? He wasn't the first candidate of any of the five permanent members, or at least not to my knowledge. Certainly not Russia, the US, UK, or China. Maybe France, but France was very close to the best on this one. So I don't think he was really the first choice of anybody. Uh, furthermore, all expectations were that it was going to be a woman. And ideally, from the point of view of Russia, a woman from Eastern Europe, because there is this informal rotation. Okay? Um, so the fact that he rose to the surface says something to the top, says something about the process here. I'm not sure it would have happened if there hadn't been this more open process. Okay? And maybe even a little more telling, it was very hard for candidates who joined the race late to make up for lost ground. Okay? Two in particular, Cristiana Figueres from Costa Rica, who I actually advised a little bit uh, as she was thinking about what she could do as Secretary General, and the other was Kristalina Georgieva from Bulgaria. Okay? Both, from my point of view, would have been excellent Secretary Generals. I actually thought Georgieva had a really good chance of winning. I assumed that it was going to come down to a drawn-out race between Georgieva and Guterres. Um, but by the time her name was thrown into the ring, and this is partly a result of Bulgarian politics, all the momentum was in favor of Guterres, and it really was too late. Okay? Now that does say something about the openness of the process because in the old days a candidate could be injected at the very last minute that nobody had ever even heard of and all of a sudden they're elected. Okay? A lot harder to do that this time around and presumably this will have an impact next time around. If you want to join the race, join early. Okay? Now all of that being said, I think Guterres is going to be an excellent Secretary General. Okay? He's a former Prime Minister of Portugal. So he's got that stature, he's got the political savvy which comes with being a former prime minister. He can speak to heads of state, heads of government, foreign ministers. He was the high commissioner for refugees for 10 years. So he knows the UN system and he worked in one of the areas that was most fraught, most difficult, 10 years of migration, refugee, internally displaced crises. He has a reputation for being an empathetic person, who sort of kind of understands, having worked with a lot of refugees, understands better than most what it's like, the plight, and he's a great communicator. He speaks very well. So I'm optimistic about what he can do. Uh, I think he's a great choice. And uh, while there was a lot of hope and expectation, including on my part, that it would be a woman this time around, it's not as if they pulled somebody who really is unqualified for the job. He has the qualifications for the job. Okay? So, priorities. What should he do? To begin with, some of the priorities are going to be thrust upon. Okay? He's not going to have any choice to make Syria a priority. Okay? And he may want to say, I'll leave Syria to somebody else, but he can't. Okay? When Boutros Ghali came to power, he was uh, came to office, he was not expecting to spend half of his time on Bosnia. When Kofi Annan came to office, he was not expecting to spend three quarters of his time on Iraq. Okay? These are crises that were thrown up that a Secretary General has to deal with, they have no choice. But beyond those immediate crises, the Secretary General has to be selective. There are infinite potential issues that he could address, that he could make a priority, and deciding on what those priorities should be he has to consider what the comparative advantage of the Office of Secretary General is, where he can truly add value. And I think the comparative advantage or the ability to add value stems from three factors. First of all, the global reach of the UN. It's a universal organization. It's multidimensional capacity. 
spanning security, development, human rights, and humanitarian action. It cuts across the spectrum of international affairs issues. And the prestige of the office as a bully pulpit, a platform for speaking out on behalf of the world's most vulnerable people. Okay? So these are the sort of things that make the office distinctive and give the Secretary General some potential, some leverage to make a difference. Okay? Applying those criteria to the uh, issues ahead of the Secretary General, they're not crises thrust upon him, but choices that he can make. I see four broad areas. Okay? Fixing peace operations, operationalizing preventive action, implementing key sustainable development goals, and asserting normative leadership on cutting edge uh, global issues. What I'm not going to talk about in the presentation, but I'm happy to answer questions about, is reform of the UN, reform of the institution, including Security Council reform, if you want to ask me about that. Um, so going through each of these one at a time. Uh, the term fixing peace operations. Okay? The term peacekeeping or peace operations doesn't appear anywhere in the UN Charter. Okay? The practice has been improvised from the start and it's gone through some dramatic transformations in recent years. Okay? Two developments in particular are noteworthy. First, peace operations have become more militarily robust. Okay? In the early days, the use of force was limited and only in self-defense. Nowadays, peace operations are authorized to use force well beyond self-defense, not to win a war or to defeat a designated enemy. That's war, that's not peace anything. But to protect civilians, to deter spoilers, to create security around elections, a whole range of things where military capacity is required and the use of force is uh, often an option. Okay? Secondly, they become much more politically ambitious. In the early days, peace operations simply monitored ceasefires and buffer zones. Okay? Nowadays, they monitor human rights. They repatriate refugees, help internally displaced persons to go home. Okay? They conduct elections. They engage in security sector reform. They try to encourage participatory governance through elections, etc., etc. So they get right down to some of the most fundamental aspects of governance of states. Okay? Now, these more robust, more ambitious operations have had mis mixed success at best. And over the years, there have been calls to scale back, okay, to revert to the earlier days of traditional peacekeeping, or not to do it at all. Okay? Don't try to keep the peace unless there really is a peace to keep. Okay? Uh, political circumstances have conspired to make that impossible. Okay, and there are more personnel deployed in UN peace operations today than ever before. And that's not likely to dissipate anytime soon, in part because there are no obvious alternatives. Okay? One, alternative, one alternative is give war a chance. That's politically impalatable in a lot of places. There are other places where it seems to be the solution, but it's politically impalatable. And in many situations, there's no other organization or group of states that has the capacity and the legitimacy and the expectations that the UN has. Okay? So how to make peace operations better? Three suggestions. First, improve the capacity to protect civilians, okay? and especially to protect civilians against mass atrocities and other forms of serious systematic violence. Now, ideally, this can be done through non-coercive means, okay? simply establishing a deterrent presence, human rights monitoring, community engagement, but sometimes force is necessary. And peace operations need to have the resources, the mandate, and the will to use force. Okay. Now, it would make a big difference if some of the countries from the global north got back into the business of UN peacekeeping. Okay. Right now, as that slide indicated, it's dominated by a handful of countries from South Asia and Africa. The Europeans has essentially pulled out of it. Canada essentially pulled out of it. The US was never involved in a big way. The Europeans are tiptoeing back in. Canada is tiptoeing back in. Okay? And I think this is useful. Uh, not with infantry troops, okay? but with so-called enablers, intelligence capabilities, engineers, that sort of thing. But also the presence, the political presence of peacekeepers from the global north means they have more of a stake in trying to ensure success. Okay? So there are good reasons for them to step back in, and there are signs that they're beginning to, uh, although they're very halted. 
But second, no peace operation can succeed if based on force alone. Okay? And indeed, a major problem in recent years has become the tendency, tendency to prioritize security over political solutions. Okay? It's all about short-term security stability, not thinking too much about what the end game is from a political point of view. Okay? So what that means is when force is used in a peace operation, it has to be harnessed to a political strategy. So for example, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the UN peace oper operation there in MINUSCO had significant success against some armed groups in the eastern part of the country, but there was very little po political follow-up to fill the space created by their defeat. So what the UN has to do is get much better at identifying politically achievable goals and then using a whole spectrum of instruments it's got at its disposal to try to facilitate a homegrown peace process and not one that's imposed from the outside through military force. Right. And third, end sexual exploitation and abuse by peacekeepers once and for all. Okay. Important steps have been taken since these allegations first surfaced about 20 years ago. And there was an influential report by the current High Commissioner for Human Rights, Prince Zaid in Jordan, and there have been steps to try to implement some of the ideas in that report. Uh, probably the most significant from the point of view of the UN, which will seem surprising to you that it took this long for it to happen, is that earlier this year, the UN began naming countries whose troops or police were alleged to have committed sexual exploitation and abuse when the countries weren't following up with investigation, prosecution, and punishment. Okay, for the longest time, you wouldn't even be able to find out where these troops came from. Now, at least you know that they come from this list of countries, and by the way, there are a lot of countries on that list, and you've got a record of what they've done, how they started an investigation, were there trials, what was the outcome of the trials, etc., etc. So a little bit of naming and shaming there may make a difference, but there's a lot more that could be done. Could be done. Sending entire contingents home, basically saying, you're gone. Okay. Uh, court marshals in the places where the abuses occur. Okay. The court marshals are undertaken by the troops, the countries that provide the troops, of course, but do it in the places where they occur, so justice is not only to be done, and even withholding reimbursement for troops until the perpetrators are brought to justice or until there's evidence that there's been a proper exercise of justice and all that. Okay? So there are more steps that could be taken, and I'm fairly certain that uh, Antonio Guterres will be looking closely at that. Um, second priority, um, operationalize prevention. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. No one disagrees with that truism, but it's notoriously difficult to operationalize. Okay? It's hard enough to generate political will to deal with a crisis that's occurring. How do you get governments to address a crisis that have not yet materialized? Okay? And when preventive action is taken, it's hard to claim success because it's impossible to prove that the crisis would have happened but for that action. Okay. But that being said, there is new momentum for putting prevention back at the center of everything the UN does. How? Um, well, first of all, let me talk about operational prevention and then talk about structural prevention. Okay. Operational prevention is essentially mediation, diplomatic action, the sort of sorts of things you imagine you'd want to do to prevent a conflict. This does not require more early warning. A lot of people say what we need is better early warning. We need to anticipate these crises. That's not the problem. There's usually plenty of information about potential crises. What's missing is the ability to properly analyze that readily available information and to propose constructive, politically realistic preventive action. Related to that, it requires experienced medi mediators who can operate at multiple levels. Okay? Subnational, national, regional, and global. Okay? Too often, conflicts or treaties is, is involving just two actors, a government and a rebel group. Yet in most cases, national context, conflicts are fueled by subnational tensions from below, and they're exacerbated by intervention by regional and global powers from the outside. Okay? So what we need, look at Mali, look at Syria, this is an image of Mali here. Um, so what we need for more effective preventive action of the operational type 
is uh, uh, operating all of those levels and mediators, experienced mediators who have the capacity to do that, and that's rare. Structural prevention, this is about getting at the root causes of the conflict, not just resolving a dispute or anticipating a dispute and, and making sure it doesn't escalate, but getting deeper at the root causes. And what that means in practical terms is viewing prevention not only in terms of diplomacy and dispute settlement, but encompassing a whole range of activities from human rights and humanitarian action to development and good governance. governance okay? And one of the things Guterres has already said he wants to make a priority is gender equality and the empowerment of women. Uh, smart, since he beat out seven women for the job to say that. Um, but what it means is promoting girls' education, tackling gender-based violence, uh, more access to economic resources, more women in leadership positions, okay? and what that means is implementing the Sustainable Development Goals, which is my next topic, is important not only for development purposes, but also the conflict, conflict prevention purposes. Um, so, sustainable development goals, okay? These are them. 17 of them. Last one's cut off. 17 goals, 169 targets, and countless indicators adopted by the UN General Assembly in September 2015. Okay? They're the centerpiece of what's called Agenda 2030. It's the follow-up to the Millennium Development Goals adopted in the year 2000, but with one important difference. The SDGs have targets and indicators for every country in the world. The MDGs were directed largely at the Global South. It was about what the Global North could do for the Global South. To fulfill these sustainable development goals, there are plenty of countries in the Global, in the global North that fall short on a lot of these. Okay? So now, what can the, S the Secretary General do about this? Well, going back to these comparative advantages, you should focus on the goals or the aspects of them that are truly global, that can benefit from the UN's multidimensional capacity and on which the bully pulpit can be used effectively. Okay? And I don't have time to go into details about all of them, but let me comment on just two. Okay? First is a problem of infectious disease. The Ebola crisis being the poster child for this, earlier episodes that generated a lot of international attention were HIV, AIDS, SARS, avian flu, and today we've got the Zika virus. Okay? <coughs> Now, these deserve special attention, uh, not because they're the greatest global killers. Okay? Cardiovascular disease has that honor, okay? and among infectious disease, tuberculosis is probably the highest. But because these diseases, these infectious diseases, cut across all three of the UN's pillars, okay? development, security, and human rights. So if you think about the Ebola crisis in West Africa, the lack of health infrastructure in the countries that were most affected uh, meant that they were woefully unprepared to handle it, a development problem. Okay? Plus, it occurred in states that were coming out of protracted conflict, Sierra Leone and Liberia, meaning it was a security concern as well. And the securitization of health, as some people put it, the securitization of the response involving not just medical teams, but military and police forces, including, by the way, the U.S. Army, raised human rights concerns, for example, overly aggressive quarantines. Okay? So um, Ebola is an especially troubling case, and especially in the circumstances in which it arose, but it's certainly not the only case, and experts all say we're likely to see more of these ahead. The Secretary General can play an important role here in ensuring the UN system is as prepared as it can be. Okay? Um, another sustainable development goals that deserve some close attention on the part of the SG is Sustainable Development Goal 16. Promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Okay. This goal was surprisingly difficult to negotiate. Okay. Surprisingly difficult to get the 193 member states to agree on this because it explicitly draws a nexus between development and security. Okay? And so many in the development community worry that the security agenda is going to hijack the development agenda. Okay? So they're worried that, for example, all the resources will go to countries, in the, to countries that are coming out of conflict or in the midst of conflict, or fragile states that could be safe havens for terrorists, and not to more traditional uh, health development programs seeking to end poverty or promote education. 
Okay? And so for precisely that reason, SDG 16 ought to be a priority for the Secretary General. This nexus is real. The security development nexus is real. Whether we like it or not, leadership by the Secretary General can help to manage that complex dynamic. Uh, and finally, the fourth priority area, uh, normative leadership on some cutting edge global issues. And let me just highlight a couple of those and explain how the Secretary General can show some normative leadership. So issue one is forced displacement. The total number of refugees and internally displaced persons has reached an all-time high of 65.3 million in 2015. That graph shows the trend. We're up to a peak of 65 million. That was 2015 and may well be higher in 2016 once the stats are collected. Of those, 40.8 million are internally displaced persons. The refugee and migration crisis in Europe, of course, has garnered a lot of attention these days, and rightfully so, but there are massive problems elsewhere. In Kenya, the government is attempting to push all the Somali refugees back across the border. In Central America, there are growing numbers of people fleeing organized crime and violence. Okay? And the legal and institutional architecture we have to deal with this is inadequate. Okay? There's a refugee convention, that applies to people who cross borders because they feared persecution of various types. Okay? We don't have a treaty for internally displaced persons, let alone one that applies to all migrants who fear for their lives or livelihoods. And even in the Refugee Convention, the definition of a refugee is subject to varying national interpretations, resulting in people being sent back to conflict zones contrary to the principle of non-refoulement, the basic principle that you don't send somebody back the places where they face persecution. Okay? As a former High Commissioner for Refugees, of course, Antonio Guterres is especially well placed to try to sort out this legal thicket. Um, second area where he can exercise some normative leadership is in effort to counter violent extremism. Okay? The threat of terrorism and other forms of violent extremism raise a host of difficult legal questions. Is there a responsibility to protect that permits one state or a group of states to, to intervene in another to end atrocities? How can non-state actors be held to account for violations of humanitarian law? Are drone strikes in Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen legal? Which of the various interveners in Syria is acting legally? What about cyber attacks? What's the law on cyber attacks? Okay. There's a lot of confusion all around all of this. Not an easy area for the Secretary General to wade into because fundamental interests of the great powers are at stake here. Uh, but to give an example of something that he could do at the normative level, a group of countries that have constituted themselves as ACT, which stands for Accountability, Coherence, and Transparency, have proposed a code of conduct calling on every UN member state to make the following pledge if they're elected to the Security Council, or it kicks in if they're elected to the Security Council. Okay? Not to vote against a credible draft resolution before the Security Council on timely and decisive action to end the commission of genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes, or to prevent such crimes. Okay? Now what this means in practical terms for the five permanent members, is that they're signing a pledge that in effect says we're not going to use our veto powers to stop action on mass atrocity crimes. Okay? So far, 104 countries have made this pledge, including France and the United Kingdom, both permanent members of the Security Council. The US, Russia, and China have not. Okay? So the sort of thing a Secretary General can do is first of all come out strongly in favor of this pledge, publicly urge all states to sign, including the three permanent members of the Security Council, and could initiate similar pledges in other areas, for example, respecting human rights, encountering terrorism, and violent extremism. He can't force compliance with the pledge, of course, but it's a way of using the bully pulpit to advance some new norms. Okay? So that's an illustration of how a Secretary General can push, push the normative agenda forward simply by virtue of the office. Okay, so to conclude, the UN is in crisis, political signs are worrying, nationalist leaders on the rise in many parts of the world, respect for international law and international institutions on the decline, 
it makes the most impossible job in the world even more impossible. Uh, but that's all the more reason why the UN needs someone at the helm who's willing and able to assert some global leadership. With luck, the geopolitical winds will shift and Mr. Guterres will be able to do some positive good in the next five or ten years. If they don't shift, he'd be wise to remember the immortal words of Dag Hammarskjöld. The United Nations was not created to bring us to heaven, but to save us from hell. Thank you very much. And Mics up here at the front, so come up to the mic. Or you can use this one. Yeah. All right. So first of all, just thanks again for coming out here to speak with us today. It's been really great. Uh, excellent overview of what we're looking at in the coming years with the UN. So with um, regard to something we were talking about uh, in the Sustainable Development Goals, the Millennium Development Goals uh, received much of the same criticism of the Sustainable Development Goals in that yeah. there's like these very lofty ideas of, of fighting poverty, of fighting hunger, things that are kind of uh, esoteric and all that. Um, do you think that aiming for no poverty is detrimental to the goal? Should it have a more realistic setting? Or are these kind of ideals a better way to approach to set the bar high and then see what we can achieve. Yeah, yeah. So that's about goals and targets. So there's a goal which is aspirational and the targets are meant to be achievable. You know, the, the experts say these are achievable. Uh, it depends on the political winds aligning and all sorts of things. But the, they're not, none of them is set uh, with the idea that they're unrealistic, but let's aim high and hope we get halfway there. Okay. Okay? That being said, the Sustainable Development Goals are more aspirational, there are more of them, uh, they're more difficult to achieve than the Millennium Development Goals. So those complaints about the Millennium Development Goals in the early stages were partly, uh, they were tempered a little bit as time went on because it turned out it was possible to reach some of those goals. So absolute poverty was reduced by half. Okay? Now, why did that happen? It's not necessarily because the international community ra rallied around the goal, but because India and China made a lot of progress. And so all of a sudden, in the aggregate, the world was looking a whole lot better. A lot of countries in sub-Saharan sub Africa went backwards. But nevertheless, there was substantial progress made. I think the real concern here is that these goals were, I wouldn't call it the lowest common denominator, but they were sort of the grab bag of everything that almost every government and every constituency wanted to throw in there. Now that, we've got them now, so there's no point in trying to undo that. The challenge is to be targeted and selective and where are the different entities that have a, a role to play here? Where should they exercise most of their energy? Mm -hmm. And that largely comes down to national plans. Okay. You know, each country should come up with a plan and is trying to come up with a plan which selects the goals that they think are a priority for them and ones that they think are achievable. And that's why I sort of looked at this from the point of view of the Secretary General. Where should the Secretary General himself be exercising a little bit of extra energy? So it's more in the value of those targets as bullet points, there's like, what, around 200 of them that, that everyone can kind of focus on, that they have value, or more so than the overarching ideas of... Well, the targets themselves at least, you know, give some specificity to what they're trying to do. So, hey folks, let's end poverty isn't going to get you very far unless you start to think, here's specifically what we want to do. But they're still vague. Uh, some of them are not realistic politically. Uh, so there really is a matter here of using some, uh, some judgment as to where you're really going to put your energy. Mm -hmm. And by you, I'm talking about the agents here. The, who are the agents? You know, we can't say you, us, the world. It's got to be, what should the World Bank do? What should the OECD do? What should the African Union be doing? What should the UN Secretary General be doing? What should NGOs be doing? Where can the private sector contribute here? Which parts of the private sector? So that's sort of burrowing down, and that's starting to happen now. Uh, you know, we'll see in 15 years how well it worked. I'm nervous, that's why I said there's a potential <laughs> crisis here, because we've got these lofty goals that may simply fade into oblivion, and we'll have no sense of common purpose. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for that really insightful talk. Um, I'd like to focus a bit on this, um, 
the 17th um, SDG, which is about partnerships as a way of achieving all yeah. these lofty objectives. And one of my deep anxieties is that in the light of incredibly limited funding environments, the UN and its specialized agencies are seeking more and more to partner with the private sector. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not, it's understandable, the entire program budget of the WHO, which as you know is a specialized agency of the UN, the entire biennial budget of the WHO is exceeded solely by the marketing budgets that Coke and Pepsi put together. Put together. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about how to tackle something like cardiovascular disease, and in fact all the non-communicable diseases associated, associated with obesity, which indeed are in part as a result of the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages and other products of the food industry more broadly, mm -hmm. it seems to me to be fundamentally problematic. What's your view on part on the UN, the WHO, the FAO partnering with industry to address problems that those industry actors are themselves contributing to mm -hmm. and exacerbating? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's how I was going to respond. On the one hand, I don't think anybody doubts that it's important to strengthen these partnerships, especially when it comes to development. You know, the, the amount of money you were talking about, the budget of Coca-Cola and whatnot, but the amount of money in official development assistance is completely um, dwarfed by foreign rep investment. So, you know, the real money is in the private sector. And so the argument is, can't we somehow harness the wealth in the private sector to achieve some of these lofty goals. Um, and you know, you spoke about the WHO. It's, it's not only the corporations, but also the foundations. So the Gates Foundation, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Gates Foundation is the second largest contributor to the WHO after the government of the United States, which means that the Gates Foundation has a significant amount of influence over the direction of the WHO's work. Um, so that sort of illustrates the problem here. If you're partnering with the private sector, especially if you're partnering with the for-profit side of the private sector, how do you ensure that the, the sort of priorities and the approaches and the strategies are driven towards achievement of the, the goals themselves as opposed to facilitating or legitimizing profit-making uh, by certain organizations? And you know, the UN has been struggling with this. It has the global compact which is sort of meant to um, harness some of the energy in the private sector, which is very much mixed success. But you know, the answer to the question is, I believe that the UN does have to partner, and the specialized agencies are probably in a better position to do that than the UN Secretariat, because they can partner around very concrete programs and ensure that the programs themselves serve a collective purpose, the development purpose of the humanitarian so just to add one thought in response, so you're absolutely right that there are all these other entities, including philanthropies, that have great resources. And I gave a talk at uh, Johns Hopkins at SAIS just a few months ago, and somebody said to me, what are the priorities in global health? And my reply was, who gets to determine what are the priorities in global health? That's the real question, and it's the people who are bringing the money to the table. Yeah. Yeah. I am from Liberia, and uh, I have concern relative to your analysis relative to sexual exploitation. Yeah. I'm wondering whether the United Nations or those of you that are documenting events are taking into consideration children that are born out of this uh, I of sexual exploitation. I am a witness of uh, a lot of children that were born from some of those peacekeepers. Yeah. And sometimes they leave the country and go back home, whether it's as a result of some administrative decision from within the UN. But this case I actually abandoned and I guess no one knows about them. Yeah. And sometimes they leave and suffer from uh, economic problem, full situation and what have you. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually wondering whether or not these documentations you guys are doing I actually take into account documenting this case that I've born out of these uh, yeah. social expectations. Yeah, yeah. It's not something I know a lot about. Uh, I have heard uh, talk recently of uh, what's called peacekeeper babies. Oh. And uh, they, at this point, what I know is that there's more of an effort to identify 
to understand, to find these babies who were born as a result of this, and voluntarily, as opposed to through some sense of legal obligation, compensating, providing, in some way, trying to address this. But very early days on that. So there's not nearly as much of that going on as there should be. And again, this is sort of one of the aspects of what Guterres ought to be focusing on going forward. Okay? I wish I could tell you more about how much the UN knows, how much the UN is trying to find out, how much the UN is trying to address this problem, how it's trying to address some of this. I don't know enough about that. Hi, so again, thank you for coming uh, here this evening. You mentioned um, one of the Millennium Development Goals and also a sustainable development goal now is empowering women and gender equality. Yeah. And you also talked about the election with the new Secretary General and how we had a lot of qualified women. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the implications of, again, the UN failing to elect a female um, leader and um, kind of what that means for the future. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough question. Um, the, the expectations were, were high, and not just internationally, but in and around the UN itself. Um, you know, the, all the money was on the next Secretary General being a woman, simply because there seemed to be enough support for that politically, and enough excellent candidates on the table who had been nominated, and who were demonstrating what it took to have, for the job, the people thought, well, it's going to land, it's going to, sooner or later, it's going to end up there. The fact that it didn't was, was surprising. Um, you know, Guterres is extremely well qualified, so that's my starting point here. Is that it isn't as if they chose somebody who wasn't qualified for the job. Whether he's better or less well qualified than all the other candidates, it's hard to judge because there's so many factors that go into this. But it is, it is worrying. It is worrying that the signal being sent here is after all of this expectation, after all of the energy, after all the politicking around this, all of a sudden it's, no, next time. And next time, maybe 10 years from now. Okay? Um, he's, I think he's got, a, he's got some responsibility here to, to try to mitigate some of the, the symbolic, some of the messaging this creates. And I think he's going to have to do it in part by looking very carefully at the senior management structure of the United Nations, uh, women in senior positions in the field and peace operations, humanitarian operations and whatnot. Um, but that's not the same thing as the Secretary General. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about it, um, but I would be more worried about it if I felt that the person who was selected really wasn't up to the job and it was some backroom old boys network that produced this thing. Okay. So uh, you mentioned in your presentation uh, a bit about UN peacekeeping operations, and I was yep. wondering uh, how you feel that the UN should move forward on operations that have been ongoing for decades, like UNIFIL, UNTSO, UNDOF, mm -hmm. um, and what the implications would be if those missions were, were scrapped, uh, uh -huh. given that they, like you mentioned in your presentation, you said perhaps peace should only be kept if there's a peace to maintain, yeah. what, what are the implications for scrapping those uh, yeah. TKOs? Yeah, yeah. We just had a discussion about this over lunch with Professor Jett, so uh, <laughs> it's, on, it's on my mind. Um, my, my starting point is the question that you asked, which is, what if they weren't there? So it's, again, the peacekeeping mission may not bring us to heaven, but is it going to save us from hell? In other words, would the situation be worse and in what ways would it be worse if there was no peacekeeping mission at all? Would it be replaced by something else? Would it result in more political pressure to actually end the conflict or to address the conflict more intensively through political means? Or would it lead to an escalation? Okay? And you know, the, the sort of best, the test case for this, I guess, in trying to speculate is, is UNIFIL in southern Lebanon. UNIFIL has uh, a mandate that it's really not able to fulfill, and it's got um, a lot of fairly significant countries contributing to it, including some European powers. So this is an area where the Europeans are back in the business. I'm worried that if UNIFIL were withdrawn, that 
it wouldn't mean, oh, all of a sudden there would be political dynamics that are going to result in a, in a, uh, a broader solution in the Israeli-Lebanon conflict, the impact of the spillover from Syria. I'm worried that it would mean, not immediately, but small <coughs> bits of conflict would quickly escalate. And before you know it, they'll have an all-out war between Hezbollah and Israel, for example. So I'm sort of inclined to think, be careful before withdrawing a peace operation simply because you can't point to progress as fast as you would like to be able to point to it. Now, UNIFIL is big. Some of the others, you probably could withdraw, and the consequences wouldn't be so great. It's much more political constituencies support them. So the UNSO, the UN Truth Supervision Organization, we could live without that. It costs barely nothing, and it turns out that the political capital, and I don't fully understand it, but the political capital that's necessary to withdraw it really isn't worth the money that would be saved. So, you know, they're, they're kind of backhanded, backwards reasons why these missions continue. Um, but, you know, there, there definitely is a problem that, you know, these missions, the, the mandate evolves and evolves and evolves, and there's always some excuse, some reason for it to continue. And at a certain point, basically, the mission has to be withdrawn, and it's usually going to have to be the result of a hard political decision, and not because everybody agrees, ah, mission accomplished, we can go home. Okay. Liberia, um, where was the question from? Liberia is an interesting case, and again, cor correct me if I'm wrong here, but the U.S. and the U.K. and others have been saying, let's withdraw that mission from Liberia, UNMIL, and it's Liberian government and the Liberian population to the extent that it's able to express it, is saying, don't leave yet. You know, we don't want you to leave because we're nervous that as soon as it leaves, things will revert to the way they were before. So, you know, the, the, the U.N. is trying to end the mission and the, the local population and authorities are saying, no, don't, go, don't leave so fast. Same thing happened in Timor-Leste. They wanted to close it down, and Jose Ramos Horta and others said, no, 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 don't go yet. Thank you. Hi. So you opened the door to talk about um, reform, so I'm going to go for it. <laughs> a lot of the problem with a lot of international institutions is they, they tend to be rather isolated yeah. and tend towards groupthink. Um, I studied EU, and even now we're just starting to get and, um, parties within the EU that are Eurosceptic and are willing to bring those issues to the table, but the UN doesn't really have that. And the criticism largely comes from outside, and I'm sure people in the UN are aware of a lot of the problems, but it doesn't get talked about and it doesn't get addressed. Yeah. H how can you sort of address the deliberative deficit or the democratic deficit of these sort of institutions mm -hmm. um, tending towards reform, hopefully? Yeah. Yeah. Um, great question. So, first of all, to be clear here, when you're talking about inside and outside the UN, if you think of the UN as a collective of 193 member states, then nobody's outside except maybe Taiwan. Um, but I think what you're asking is about the UN secretariat and the professional staff as opposed to the member states. Correct. And the group think within the professional staff and the secretariat. And how can they possibly imagine reform when they're so wedded to the status quo? Um, uh, I'm not sure from my experience that the problem is lack of imagination. Um, I think the problem is, first of all, bureaucratic turf. And bureaucratic turf is sort of a natural instinct of bureaucrats. But it's exacerbated in the UN by political pressure to preserve units that don't do much, to get senior people heading departments from the national that's putting this pressure, from the country that's putting this pressure on. And that means you've got people holding on to turf, and you've got pressure from the outside saying, oh, by the way, we want to see lots of reform. But what we don't want to see is that undersecretary general position abolished because there's a French national there, and we like to have a French national in this top position. So, you know, the two things kind of work together here. Um, and secretary generals, all secretary generals have sort of come in saying, we've got to reform, we've got to reform. And they try and they manage to achieve some incremental reforms, but it's really hard to produce um, deep structural reform. That's got to come from the member states, and it's got to come from the handful of member states who have the ability to make this happen, 
as opposed to you know, a bunch of states who are saying we really want to see something. So just to give you an illustration of this, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations and the Department of Political Affairs, two different departments that work broadly in the same space. For a long, long time, people have said, shouldn't these just be merged? Why don't we merge them? Because you've got this turf battle and you've got odd situations where people are arguing for a peacekeeping mission somewhere, not because the somewhere needs a peacekeeping mission, because it then will be DPKO's responsibility. And somebody's saying, no, no, we don't need a peacekeeping mission, we need a small political mission. Not because it needs a small political mission, but because DPA will then have responsibility. So do away with all that by merging the two departments. Okay? Part of the obstacle in merging the two departments is that there are two very senior, powerful posts within the UN Secretariat, occupied by, for the most part, either the British, the French, or the Americans, and they're reluctant to say, merge them, and then one of us is going to lose our senior post there. Okay? So that, I, I worry about that more than groupthink. I think there are a lot of people within the Secretariat who see the logic for that kind of reform. Um, but, you know, bump up against some of the natural tendencies of bureaucracies and the political pressures that make it so difficult. Yeah. Fair point. But we'll see, Guterres has not talked about this. I, I, we'll see exactly what he thinks he can do in this area. Thank you. Okay. Kind of a follow-up on that. Um, my name is Caroline Kapp. I'm a student at SIA. Um, the political role of the UN lately has been ineffective at best and laughable at worst. And given that you mentioned a little bit about the political department, um, do you, and, and you also spoke about the South, um, the South, Chi, the South China Sea Islands yeah. and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and how it has been largely ineffective if not even has exacerbated the situation. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee any um, reform in the sense of obliterating all of the political Involvement or the political aspect of the of the UN, or the possibility of the expansion of the P5 or the eradication mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. and or do you foresee that it will continue with the status quo of just being a completely ineffective political role? Yeah. So the uh, there are a few questions here. The first question I think was, is it possible to imagine the UN's mission? no longer having this political aspect to it. It becomes more of a development, humanitarian, maybe human rights organization, but don't expect it to address these deep political issues. I, I don't see that happening. You know, first of all, that would require rewriting the UN Charter. And if we ever get to the point of rewriting the UN Charter, the first issue that's going to be on the agenda is Security Council Reform, mm -hmm. which brings, brings me to your second question, the related second question. Um, a lot of people will sort of throw up their hands and say Security Council reform is never going to happen because in order for it to happen, all five permanent members of the Security Council have to agree to it. They have a veto power over removing the veto power, for example. So how, how can this ever possibly happen? And despite all the efforts over the years, it hasn't happened other than changes in working methods and whatnot. I'm, if it does happen, and I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, and certainly not in the next five years, and probably not in the next ten years, but if it does happen, what's going to cause it to happen is really this crisis of relevance and legitimacy, which is going to make the Security Council so ineffective and seem to be so ineffective that the five permanent members themselves are going to have to look carefully at, do we want to preserve the Security Council or do we want it just to wither away? Now they're not going to, five of them are not going to sit down together and say let's talk about this, that's what we're going to have to do. It's going to take one country to take the lead and one country to push this agenda. And right now the only country that can do that is the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the United States' ability to do this is going to diminish with time. So if there was a, a political dynamic in the country and a leadership in the country that says we ought to make this one of our priorities, it's not inconceivable that it could happen. It basically means some really hard negotiating to get a deal that the five permanent members can agree to, that some of these emerging powers that it can agree to, and that the membership as a whole can agree to. Mm -hmm. And that's hard, hard work. The problem is most of these countries, including the US, have other priorities right now. So it's only when they get to the point thinking, if we don't do something now, either it's going to disappear and we don't want it to disappear because we actually need it, or another of the P5 is going to step up and say, I've got an idea, mm -hmm. and by the way, I've got 100 and 
23 countries that support me on this idea. And all of a sudden, the U.S. is on the back foot. Thank you. So I think there's hope that the next uh, Secretary General will work more on the refugee issue. But how much can he actually do, given that countries are shutting down the borders and refugees are seen as a burden instead of a, a, an asset for these host countries? How much can he actually do, given also that these countries um, need more financial assistance from other like, westernized countries that are not willing to give that money out? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is a, another question that goes to what is, how big is the problem and what in particular can a Secretary General do to address that problem? Uh, you know, I put this in the area of asserting normative leadership, okay? So what that means is not, okay, I've got a plan and I'm going to execute the plan and here's what's going to evolve and by the way, I hope, you know, all of you Europeans and uh, Gulf countries in the United States follow along. It's got to be more, all right, let's look at this from a normative legal point of view and see if we can push, push the boundaries a little bit and how we're going to go about pushing the boundaries a little bit. So, some people talk about a global mobility treaty, okay? A treaty which is about all movement of people, forced displacement, economic migrants, environmental migrants, Canadians who want to work in American universities like me. Uh, all, all as part of one treaty which tries to cover the sort of broad scope of issues that arise with respect to migration and all the good things and potentially bad things associated with that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't put much hope in that. I think that's too ambitious. Um, I think this is, the issues are just too divisive right now to imagine we can come up with a global treaty that's any use at all which is going to regulate all that. So it's got to be more smaller scale. You know, it's got to be, for example, a little more um, uh, bite given to the guiding principles on internal displacement, which is not hard law, but which is a body of soft law associated with human rights law that tries to at least address the problem of internal displacement. And the Secretary General can say, all right, let's look at these guiding principles. Let's look at the extent to which they're complied with internationally and the extent to which they're not. And if there are places where we think a difference can be made, let's sort of you know, exercise some energy there. So it's kind of more moderate, small-scale ambition. And this is more you know, having seen the limitations of what a Secretary General can do. I think that's what he's got to do. You know, announcing grand, my goal is to have a global mobility treaty within the next three years just ends up making him look foolish. I had a, push, a question on the uh, issues of the Security Council. Mm -hmm. Being that there's a lot of deadlock in the Security Council and like, legal, so-called legal interventions are seeming, seemingly impossible to happen, mm -hmm. do you think that there is a role for like, interventions outside the UN approval, like, for example, the UK, France, and the United States are intervening against the Assad regime, and yeah. even though it's not in the legal frameworks of the United Nations, there being a positive role for that? Yeah. So the, the United Nations Security Council could authorize intervention, but as you rightly point out, the political dynamics don't allow that. If it did, then there would be no legal questions. Okay? If it doesn't, and what you're talking about here is humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect. You're talking about intervention for the purpose of ending atrocities, as opposed to intervention for self-defense purposes, which is another category another legal justification for military action outside of the UN Security Council. If you're talking about humanitarian intervention in R2P, my view is at this point that it is not, it would not be legal. There is insufficient hard law to support that. There's insufficient state practice and what's called opinion juris in the legal world to suggest that now it's widely accepted that if the Security Council is paralyzed, if a government is oppressing its population and atrocities are being committed, that a group of countries can intervene. Okay? But, uh, let me put this in both political and legal terms. Politically, if a group of countries does intervene, it depends, what the reaction is going to be, depends to a large extent on who those countries are and what the outcome of the intervention is. Uh, and you know whether there's sort of enough political will to carry through on the implications of that. From a legal point of view, there's something called uh, the excuse of necessity. 
which means sometimes violations of the law will be excused. They won't be deemed legal, but violating the law will be excusable given the dire humanitarian circumstances. Okay? And it's based on some famous cases in US and British law where some sailors whose ship went down were on a life raft. And in one case, they ate the cabin boy because they were going to die otherwise. And in another case, they threw somebody overboard. Okay? Murder, cannibalism, they were rescued. Murder, cannibalism are not legal. They were taken back, put on trial, and the courts in each country, this is in the 1800s, in effect said, we're not going to condone what you did or describe it as legal, but we understand that in the extreme circumstances, it was necessary. And in effect, turn a blind eye, pardon them, or in the international community, it means turn a blind eye. So I can see that happening. But if you look at the Syria case, it's not that there's a whole lot of will to intervene you know, on the part of those countries who identify. Right? It's not so much the legal obstacles, but the political will and the concerns about what next. So we intervene, we protect civilians in the process, we remove Bashar Assad from power, now what? Yeah. And I think it's a good thing that that question is being asked, because you can't just say, do that and then you know, let the problem sort itself out. Yeah. Hi, so I am a Penn State law student, and that cannibalism case was the first one I read when I got here. <laughs> but so I have a question a little bit uh, more related to the legal issues. And you you said that there's no like not a lot of hard law in like addressing these kind of uh, legal questions, right? So what kind of like power or essentially actions could the UN like? take, or especially this um, Secretary General, like what kind of leadership or uh, direction could he get? On, on what? The on phenomenon the, of mass atrocities, the situation yeah. in Syria? Like, yeah. Essentially, like the, I mean, obviously the UN has a huge range of issues it addresses, but on the ones where, like we just um, talked about the outside intervention, where it's yeah. not necessarily yeah. legal, what kind of like avenues could uh, the UN take to make it legal? Well, okay, so I was thinking about it differently. What can the Secretary General do to me? So one, one thing the Secretary General could do is to be much more public in saying atrocities are being committed here, atrocities that look like they are genocidal or could become genocidal. And I'm not naming any particular place here, but I'm talking about mass atrocities of the sort that rise to that level. And call upon the members of the Security Council to face their responsibilities. In other words, say, this is a tragedy, and it's your responsibility to act. So, you know, a little bit of trying to shame the members of the Security Council in action. How much impact that's going to have? Well, if they fundamentally don't want to act, it will have no impact. But, you know, if it's sort of part of an ongoing incremental political process to try to stimulate action, to try to shame and pressure action, then it may. You know, the intervention in Libya in 2011 the Obama administration was not chomping at the bit to intervene in Libya. The Obama administration got pulled into that kind of reluctantly. The French and the British were, were leading on that, and the U.S. was positioned. Now, we'll lead from behind. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit of, you're kind of on the spot, and if you feel any pressure from your own citizenry, or you're worried about, you know, the impact it's going to have on allies and whatnot, it may on the margins push them. But you know, beyond that, sort of changing the law, the law on that particular issue, would humanitarian intervention be legal without Security Council authorization? That can only change through customary practice. And that means states are basically going to have to engage in it, and they're going to have to engage in it in a way that's understood now to be legal, and that's going to have to be widely accepted. And the reason I say there's no, there isn't enough hard law on this is because there just aren't enough cases where it's happened where the international community has collectively said, yeah, good. And we think that ought to happen again in similar cases in the future. Okay? Yeah? Well, that might be a perfect place for us to stop. It's just about time. Anybody have any last questions? No? Yeah. Good. Thank you.